Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features X-Men, that is adjectiveless X-Men, X-Men Volume 2, number 30, cover dated March 1994. And this features, at last, the wedding of Scott Summers and Jean Grey. So the cover here, wraparound cover by Andy Kubert and Matthew Ryan, featuring Scott and Jean front and center there, uh, kissing after being wedded. And we've got Havoc there, Alex Summers as best man and Storm as maid of honor. And there, there is Jean's uh, niece and nephew as well. And here in the background, we've got members from the main X teams, including uh, the X-Men Blue and Gold teams, X-Force, X-Factor, and indeed also Excalibur and the X-Mansion there right in the background. So, uh, pretty cool cover, very nice, uh, nicely composed by Andy Kubert. And once you close it over, you really do have that center focus on Scott and Jean. So let's open this one up to the splash page, which happens to be a letter from Logan to Scott and Jean explaining that he can't make it to the wedding. He says, I'm leaving for now because the old Knuckleheads parts ain't better than the whole anymore. And that's after Magneto ripped out his adamantium uh, back in X-Men number 25. And Wolverine continues with his a very fine handwriting to say, besides, it's time to take the next step in life. Maybe you should look at each other with new eyes. This the way I've had to look at myself and ask yourselves, isn't it time we do this? Isn't it time we do the same thing? Isn't it time we took the next step in our lives to love Logan? So the very nice lettering on this page by Bill Oakley. The rest of the creative team includes Fabian Nicieza, writer, Andy Kubert, penciler, Matt Ryan, inker, and Joe Rosas, colorist. And we have a first person speaker down here saying, it is at once the proudest and yet hardest moment of my life. Is it Jean who's thinking this? No, it turns out to be Professor X. So we begin with Jean, Jean being uh, dressed for the wedding uh, ceremony and she's got her mother there and uh, this isn't Jean's sister but rather it is her daughter from a potential future it happens to be Rachel so Rachel Summers and Jean Grey were reconciled somewhat um, in Excalibur number 71 so that's why uh, Phoenix uh, Rachel is present at Jean's uh, wedding and so there's a bit of uh, banter here between um, Storm and Jean's mother regarding her fidgeting and moving around while they're trying to pin the dress to her, the veil. Aurora's working on the veil and, the, and Jean's mother is working on the train behind the dress. And Jean is reading that letter from uh, Wolverine all the while. And Professor X in his first person narration says, I suppose that if I have to be honest with myself, today's events have affected me in ways I had not foreseen. At Storm's words, where uh, Storm asks Jean, is she nervous? I find my thoughts turning to the young red-headed girl who watches today's events with joy-filled eyes. And an inexplicable feeling of apprehension descends upon me. And there's another reference to that a little later. And it's interesting that Jean's reading a letter here from Wolverine and that Professor X has this thought about Rachel because if you look at my video on Uncanny X-Men Annual Number 14, that is Days of Future Present, uh, there's some hints in there and I talk about it in the video regarding Wolverine, in fact, not Cyclops being um, uh, the father of Rachel and that uh, Wolverine fathered Rachel on Jean Grey in that alternative future. So you might want to have a look at that video and see whether that might be what uh, underpins the inexplicable feeling of apprehension descending on Professor X. And so then back to the joyous day and Rachel says to Jean that she just wanted to tell her she looks great. And Jean says, thank you, Rachel. I want you to know how happy I am you're here today. I know you and I didn't get off on the right foot but that's in the past. You're very important to Scott and me, Rachel. Please believe that. And Rachel says, I know it couldn't have been easy for anyone to meet a daughter from a possible future. 
I was angry when I first came here. I didn't give a thought how other people might feel. I'm just glad we're friends now. So then they hug and uh, Jean says, more than friends, but I have to tell you, if today's wedding means that there's even the slightest chance I'll, that tomorrow I'll have Rachel Summers for a daughter, then that makes me uh, t this, th then that makes this twice as much of a blessing, she says. And Rachel responds, thanks, mom. And then the scene switches to something a little bit more comic, and that is the struggles here of uh, the X males, uh, Beast, Warren, uh, I, uh, Havoc here, and Iceman to tie Scott's bow tie. And um, there's some joking here amongst them all. Um, and I think Beast hands off. Oh no, Beast and uh, Warren here are working on that bow tie. And we have Professor X's first person narration here. He looks at these men, friend and family alike, whom he has fought with, laughed and cried with. And though, Bob, though Bobby meant what he said as a joke, the enormity of the day sinks in. I feel his mood turns slightly somber, as it always does when he grows burdened by the weight of his responsibilities. Perhaps he thinks back to his first marriage, a union that was never what it seemed and ended so tragically. And so that's really the only reference to Madeline. And you'd have to imagine that the ghost of Madeline Pryor would be hovering over Scott's wedding day, but that's as, that's as far as we go with any uh, reference to it. And she's not even named in Professor X's narration. Um, and he continues, and I do what I always have strive to do for my students. I try to help. So he comes along in his hover chair. That's a great shot of Professor X in the hover chair. Uh, with a kind of upwards angle on it as he enters the room and he picks up the bow tie and he knots it skillfully and he says you see my x-men I am as nervous as all of you are the wedding is forcing me to look at all of us in a new light what I've known for some time now is made official in a way by today's events the hard simple truth is that you are all undeniably adults now and that leads me to question myself and wonder do any of you really even need the old prof anymore but the tie is ready and scott with a smile says was that by any chance a setup and professor x admits actually i stumbled into that analogy by accident so bobby helps him put the tie on and then he's ready to go and professor x points the way out the door and he says my students my children my friends shall we take the first step together so nice moments there and so we see beast bounding out of the room and professor x getting out of his shiar tech hover chair and into a more conventional wheelchair uh, because as he says here to himself deal with the wheelchair you know you can't allow civilians to see you strutting about an alien shiar technology and as he moves from one to the other, he drops a letter on the ground. And who picks it up except for Rachel? And she says, a note from Wolverine? Jean was just looking at the one he wrote, he wrote Scott and her. And Professor X says, I'd be meaning to get to read it, but somehow the time never seemed right. And Rachel says, goodbyes are always tough, especially if you think there's still a lot left to be said before parting. Rachel, Professor X thinks here, should I mention my earlier apprehension? See, there's something being seeded there regarding uh, Rachel and maybe the fact that Cyclops is not her uh, father. Um, and that was always a concern of hers. Like, would she be born? Um, you know, given that she had uh, come to her past, how would that ad adjust? The timeline um, so interesting here the professor's reiteration of that uh, apprehension he has regarding Rachel so he decides though no Charles let it go enjoy the day so he decides he will read the letter later which indeed he does and he says Scott and Alex are outside now is Jean ready and then he sees Jean coming down the stairs but we don't see her yet 
and then Scott and Alex are up here with the uh, with the priest and um, everybody's waiting for the arrival of Jean and Alex says to Scott here breathe in Scotty and take a long look at this just look at them all and here we have on this double page spread those combined uh, wedding guests drawn from all the X teams here and we also have some special guests we've got uh, Quicksilver and Luna with um, uh, their their daughter and uh, sorry Crystal with their daughter Luna and as I said there we have um, uh, Jean's nephew and niece and over here I think this is Bobby Drake's father and mother they were there at the, at the uh, Thanksgiving dinner in Uncanny X-Men 308 I think this is Stevie Hunter here at the back and um, who else is present we've got Sean Cassidy and Maureen McTaggart here um, we, we have Psylocke but we don't have Revanche and this I think is Kitty Pride here and over here yes this is Kazar and this is Shanna oh and um, I think we've got Val Cooper here so quite an interesting mix of wedding guests and yeah I like the uh, the first caption or sorry the first person um, captions here by Professor X where he's saying I allow myself to be pulled into the gentle flow of their thoughts as they look down on those of us gathered here for Scott our presence does not serve so much to heighten his tension as to relax him with a feeling of comfort and confidence what warmth I feel in him he so rarely lets his emotions out and I so rarely pry how can I even describe the feeling of satisfaction he receives and in turn I receive from his sense of kinship to us he is proud of who we are and what we stand for proud to have us as his friends and family he had so little growing up in the orphanage and now he's among the select few who can change the way of the world how many men are lucky enough he wonders important enough to be so blessed so here the uh, wedding march is uh, struck up by the band and it's Lila Cheney's band so she's made her way there uh, to play at Scott and Jean's wedding Roro's the maid of honor as I said earlier so up the aisle she comes first of all and uh, then arrives Jean in this great anchor image with her bouquet of roses and her father here John Gray Professor John Gray looking young for a man who must be 50 at least and uh, yeah this is nice you can see uh, Rachel here resting her head on her hands Professor X looking very joyful Quicksilver too yeah great stuff and then um, her father gives her a little kiss before we move on to uh, the ceremony itself so the uh, the priest says this sash serves as a symbol of the matrimonial ties the sacred pact you make before God an exclamation of love which will serve you through good and good times and bad the wedding vows are to be spoken the wedding vows to be spoken here today have been prepared by the bride and groom themselves he says so then we get those wedding vows here and we get to see all these shots these reaction shots of the listening uh, friends and family um, including here I like the angle here Cable and Rachel watching as well so these are Scott and Jean's wedding vows there were times I was lost and you found me there were days which were heavy and you lightened my heart through it all since the day when we met there was you for me and me for you that hasn't changed that will never change times have been good and times have been bad and still our love has endured and triumphed I take Scott Summers to be my lawfully wedded husband. I take Jean Grey to be my lawfully wedded wife. Through pain and passion, through sorrow and hope, through death and through life, no matter what tomorrow will bring, we will face it together. I now pronounce you husband and wife. And let's see a kiss now, says the priest. And they do. And what an anchor image that is. And it's interesting because Scott and Madeline 
uh, the, their wedding vows and uh, the, the, the ceremony was traditional. It was the traditional one, whereas Scott and Jean have developed their own uh, vows. So an interesting little uh, character difference that. And here we've got these um, Fleer cards and you can see central to the ones included in uh, this particular issue are the original X-Men in those uh, Jack Kirby uniforms, also the Neil Adams X-Men. We've got Dark Phoenix there. We've got Scott and Jean kissing in the in the midst of uh, that John Byrne era. And finally, oh yeah, we've got the uh, the blue and gold teams here. We've got Nathan being sent into the future in X Factor sixty eight, and then we've got Scott and Jean married here. So um, nice. These ones are nice, actually, and appropriate for the particular issue. So. Let's continue with the story. So they walk off the uh, off the podium, and they go for their first dance, and we've got Rachel applauding there as well. And uh, the wedding song chosen by the couple uh, is "One" by U2. So we've got Beast there. I like this little detail, taking um, a picture of the happy couple on their first dance. And then we have Jean turning to face, uh, sorry, turns to dance with her father as Elaine practically yanks her new son-in-law along with her. How I envy them, thinks Professor X, as I remember how long ago I used to slide across the parquet like Jean Kelly. So that's a funny little detail from Professor X to imagine him dancing like Jean Kelly. And then we've got a scene switch, and this is very interesting. Who's up? in the uh, January uh, snowed in hillside, except for Sabretooth, who's out of his cell. He's allowed out for the day, but he's wearing his uh, manacles and muzzle. And um, he says aloud here, stupid idiots. Look at them all, he's like the Grinch. Happy cows just waiting to march into the slaughter with the kind of lives they live. Why would they waste the day being happy when tomorrow they might die? I could make a mess of things too, even with these fragging masks and gloves holding me back, pinning down my claws and suppressing my senses. But he gets a boot from in the back from behind. And here we hear this interesting sound effect, schluck. Who is it? Must have been um, downwind of him. So you were here after all, weren't you? He says, don't even think about it, written in the snow by who else but Wolverine and his bone claws. So he did come for the wedding, but just didn't uh, head down for the ceremony or um, reception afterwards. So this is pretty funny. We've got Beast here loaded up with uh, food from the caterers. He's got what, one, two, three, four, and one on his head, five plates of dinner for himself. Uh, Jubilee with her head in her hands, aghast at his greed. And um, we've got a nice little funny moment here as well between Bobby and Hank where Bobby says to Beast, he says, I almost forgot to ask, where's Trish Tilby today? Out on another ultra dangerous reporting assignment again. Perhaps she's with your erstwhile lady love, Opal, since I don't see her here amongst the revelers either, eh, Robert? And they both say at once, we really have to get a life together. And look, Bishop, for once, looking happy with his big plate of food. This is a funny little moment as well between um, Alex and Lorna Dane. Uh, Alex asks her, how's she holding up? And he says, or she says, oh, it's been absolutely beautiful so far, Alex. I hear a butt coming, but if one more person asks me when we're going to get married, I'll magnetically wrap a Buick around their head. This is a nice little moment here with uh, Rain, who has... Uh, gotten back her ability in X-Factor number 100 to uh, transform back to her human form. She's no longer stuck in her wolf Spain form. And she's got this nice little moment with um, Richter. And I think this is supposed to be Sam, but the color of his hair is wrong. So uh, Richter says, Rain, Sam and I can't tell you how glad we are to see you're back to your spunky, cute, red, redhead self again. She says it's a long story didn't have as happy an ending as I would have hoped. And that's of course because of the death of Jamie Madrox, who's not there at the wedding because he's dead. And um, 
here we've got a little moment, another funny moment between uh, Val Cooper and Cable. So Cable is um, uh, wanted by the uh, Federals and um, she says, Cable, Dr. Cooper, tell me am I still wanted by the government? Let's just say, I'll pretend I didn't even see you here. See who, he says. That's pretty funny. And then we've got these uh, little uh, traditions uh, where Jean throws the uh, bouquet of roses over her head. We'll see now who captures it. Jubilee's pretty interested in, capturing, in cap catching rather that bouquet, but Rogue uses her powers to fly up for, uh, and over the uh, crowd from the back to grab them. And then Scott takes a garter uh, off uh, Jean's uh, thigh and throws it to the single men, all of whom um, scuffle uh, to grab it, but who's there using his powers also to make sure that he uh, wins the garter. Mezzanine, he says, you didn't think I'd give anyone else a chance to slip this on the little lady, did you? I, I think not. So then Jean puts the first uh, slice of cake into uh, Scott's face. And here we've got an interesting moment with Cable and Rachel, contemplative, looking at the new couple. Uh, Cable, of course, uh, Scott and Madeline's son, and Rachel, putatively Scott and Jean's daughter, but perhaps, as I said earlier, Jean and Wolverine's daughter. So, the day continues, the band um, continues to play throughout the afternoon, and Lila announces that the bride has requested one last very special dance. And this is with Professor X. So of course he's uh, taken aback because, you know, how can he uh, dance with Jean? And Jean says to him, my mother taught me to save the last dance for the man who brought you to the ball. And that man, dear Charles, will be you. So she uses her TK to lift him up out of his wheelchair. And he's worried, like some of the people here, they don't know about us. And Jean says to him, look, most of the guests have left. And what if they did know about us, Charles, that I'm a mutant or that I'm a woman who wants to celebrate the best day of her life? If dancing with you is what, make me, is what makes me happy and if being a mutant gives me the opportunity to do that, she says, then there's nothing in the world I would rather be than a mutant. And I'm proud to dance with the man who taught me that being one should in no way limit the happiness I can enjoy or the love I might share with those I'm blessed to call my family. So they're all watching and uh, it's quite the emotional moment, yes? Good stuff. And then it's the evening time. And I like this, evening comes those guests who have stayed are either turning in for the night or have gone off to Harry's hideaway for a nightcap. And I sit as usual, it seems, of late alone, doing what I do best, thinking. But Scott arrives to have um, a farewell chat with the professor. And um, he says, uh, the professor says to him, it's hard to imagine, Scott, how a day could be happier than this one was. And Scott says, as he walks out the door with his travel bag, ready for his honeymoon with Jean, he says, that's the point, sir. sir. Because of what you've taught us, how you raised me, I fully expect it can and will be a better day. I just wanted you to know that I wanted to finally tell you that if it weren't for you, for your guidance and your courage, for the sense of purpose you've given me, I would have been lost. You saved me, you gave my life meaning, gave me hope, gave me the chance to become something more, better than I would ever have been. For all that I want, I, for all that I thank you and I wanted to say, I love you, Charles Xavier. So that's quite interesting, picking up from a moment in X-Men Unlimited 1 where um, Scott wasn't even able to call Professor X by his first name. And now he's gotten to the point where he can say this. Also, we get a little detail there that he's just come from um, receiving a Shi'ar comlink message from his father. So just in case you thought that Christopher Summers had forgotten his son on his son's wedding day, no, he sent a message from uh, the Shi'ar galaxy. And then we're left with Professor X alone in the study 
and um, the first person uh, narration captions in them, he thinks, I hear the car pull out, they're gone, the house is still. And in this rare moment of silence, I find myself looking at the work in front of me, the house and people around me with new eyes. This morning I felt the weight of what has been and what is to come crushing me down, but now I feel a dawning. And we've got interesting things here in his hands that he's reviewing, files he's reviewing. The Massachusetts Academy, a division of the Xavier Institute. The Massachusetts Academy will become the school for Generation X. Uh, we also have this note from Moira McTaggart regarding how maybe cables, DNA, might hold the key to a vaccine for the legacy virus. And then Professor X sees the letter from um, Wolverine, which he opens. And it's very simple. Dear Chuck, lighten up your old pal, Logan. So the dawning, a dawning of renewed hope and laughter as the night falls on the wedding of Scott and Jean uh, Summers. So really, really nice issue. No villains show up, um, no disruption to the wedding, no conflict, just a really, really nice uh, celebration of the love of Scott and Jean and their marriage. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on X-Men number 30. If you did, please like the video in YouTube and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.